you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, uh, folks. It's Voss here from thechrisvossshow.com. Thechrisvossshow.com. Welcome to the big show, folks. We certainly appreciate you guys being here. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, children, women, and uh, everyone in between, uh, whatever you want to call yourself, welcome to the big circus tent in the sky. We'll be going to be talking about the mob today. We're not talking about uh, you know the line at the local buffet. We're talking about the mafia. La Cosa Nostra, this thing of ours, as they like to call it. Uh, or at least that's what I've heard. I don't know. <laughs> I, I'm going to say plausible deniability. I, I don't recall, sir. Um, anyway, guys, we're going to be talking uh, about a wonderful author and his uh, story and uh, his interviews with people from the mob, the mafia, the big thing. Uh, so anyway, before we get into that, as always, we've got to do the plugs. So go to goodreads.com for us. Christmas, YouTube.com for us. Christmas, LinkedIn.com for us. Chris Voss, and uh, all those crazy places on the internet. <clears throat> he is the author of the newest book that just came out, uh, July 11th, 2023. The Life We Choose, William Big Billy Delia. Did I pronounce that right? Delia? Delia. Uh, Delia. And The Last Secrets of America's Most Powerful Mafia Family, Matt Birkbeck is on the show with us today, and he joins us to talk about this latest book. And uh, it's going to be a fun read. There might be some Hoff in here if you're familiar with that story. Uh, Matt is an investigative journalist and author of six books, including The Quiet Dawn, Deconstructing Sammy and A Deadly Secret, as well as A Beautiful Child and Finding Sharon, which were ad adapted by Netflix for their hit movie Girl in the Picture for which he served as an executive producer. His work is also appearing in Playboy, Rolling Stones, New York Times, People, Reader's Digest, and other publications. Uh, what did your centerfold look like, Matt, in Playboy when you were in there? <laughs> it wasn't me, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Matt, welcome to the show. Uh, give us a .com so people can find you on the interwebs, please. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, give us your .coms uh, so people oh, can find you on uh, the interwebs, please. Uh, MattBurkbeck.com and uh, matt.berkbeck.author on uh, Instagram. There you go. So you've written quite a few books. What made you uh, interested in this story and telling it in this latest book for of yours? In this particular case, the story found me. Uh, Billy D'Elia had been the head of the Buffalino crime family uh, from 1994 until 2006 when he went to prison. Uh, but before that, he had spent nearly 30 years as the protege and so-called son of Russell Buffalino, who was arguably the most important and influential member of organized crime uh, in the 20th century. And Billy, I had gotten an email. It was a summer afternoon in the middle of COVID and it, uh, email said, are you interested in talking to Billy? And I almost jumped out of my chair because I knew Billy, every law enforcement agency in the country had tried to talk to Billy about mm -hmm. things, mostly because of his relationship with Buffalino. Uh, FBI, Secret Service, Homeland Security, New York City Terrorism tra Task Force, and Billy didn't speak to anyone. Uh, so when I got that email uh, and he said he'd like to talk, I said, sure, and I went for it. There you go. What what drew him to you? Did you owe him money on the VIG or what, uh, What you know, was, did he come around and be like, hey, it's a nice auth authorship you have here? Sorry. I'm happy to say I did not owe him money. I had covered him, <laughs> I had covered him when I was a newspaper reporter. In oh, really? I did. So I knew who he was. I had cover, covered him when he got arrested. Uh, I was writing these investigative pieces uh, involving Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania brought casino gambling to the state in the early 2000s, and it was a mess. And who was getting licenses and how it was fixed and the corruption that was involved in all of that. And one of the individuals seeking a license was a very well-connected billionaire in Pennsylvania who had known Billy and did Billy with the Buffalinos for well over 30, 40 years. And Billy blames his arrest on this individual. Wow. Billy was also upset with the film The Irishman uh, and how oh. Russell had been portrayed, Russell Buffalino. You know, Russell was all powerful. And in the film, mm -hmm. it 
didn't appear that way. He also said that Frank Sheeran's story about him killing Jim, Jimmy Hoffa was fiction. Oh, and, really? Yeah. And so, and Billy knew Sheeran back in the early 70s through the 90s, and he was very much involved in the making of Sheeran's book. Mm -hmm. uh, and he knew it was fiction. And so he said he wanted to set the record straight. And we ended up spending well over a year and a half talking. That's got to be an awesome drop in the lap. I mean, that's got to be wonderful uh, to to be able to talk to him. It, it, he's billed as mafia royalty, and yeah, he, uh, yeah. he, he he was and he is because of his relationship with Buffalino. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Russell was. You know, I once said to Billy, "Was Russell ever on the commission? The mm -hmm. five hundred commission that ran the mob?" And he says, "No, he wasn't on the commission." He said, "Russell was above the commission." That's how powerful he was. So Russell had ties going back to Cuba in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. He had owned casinos. He had um, gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bobby Kennedy during hearings in Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, he had been involved in a so-called CIA mafia plots in the early 1960s where the CIA recruited members of the mob to kill Fidel mm -hmm. Castro. And, of course, he was linked to the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa mm -hmm. in 1975. Russell was one of the key suspects. So there was a, just an incredible wealth of information about Russell that uh, only Billy knew. And so I knew that, you know, obviously this was something I had to jump into. There you go. I was watching before the show, the Buffalino uh, interviews, uh, I think probably before the Senate. I couldn't see who was on the other side, but it was probably, it was, it looked like it was some sort of Senate or house hearing. And, uh, it was, it was interesting to see how vague he was about everything. He's like, I don't know. I don't recall. I don't <laughs> so, yeah, it was it was classic. I mean, it was classic Buffalino, you know, you know uh, deacon and you know ducking, not really answering questions. You know, do you know Jimmy Hoffa? How long did you know him for? I, I know, I knew him. Do you know Frank Sheeran? Yeah, I met him sometime long ago. I don't remember when. So <laughs> it was, you know, that's how they used to be. It was, you know, yeah. but he was very. What he was known for was being very secretive, very quiet, which is why law enforcement really could never, you know get its finger on the Buffalinos and what they were all about. They knew that they were powerful. They knew Russell was very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, and they could never, and they could never, as far as Billy was concerned, he always thought he was just his driver. Mm -hmm. uh, they had no idea at the immense power and influence that Billy would eventually have. And this is, this is the early mob. I guess, I guess Buffalino was known as the quiet Don. Is that correct? Yeah, he was because of the, because of his quiet way. Uh, you know, we did, I did all these interviews with Billy inside the home that Buffalino had owned in Pennsylvania and lived in. And mm -hmm. it's a very nondescript ranch house. It's not like a palace that you mm -hmm. might where these mob dons might live in. But it was it was just uh you know it was a ranch home in Kingston, Pennsylvania. And uh it's almost like a museum because it's owned by it's owned by Billy Delia's son now. It was left to him by mm -hmm. Buffalino's wife. And it was it's kept exactly the way it was in say 1975 it's like a museum in there so we ended up doing all the interviews in there but you could see how buffalino lived it was he wasn't showy and didn't seek publicity unlike some other uh mob leaders did which led to their downfalls and yeah yeah so for buffalino that was you know it was smart on his part there was a story i heard in one of the mob uh, sort of history things about one of the quiet dons and it may have been buffalino but they were they're always quiet and like they didn't they didn't uh, go themselves around or, 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 you know, like John Gotti, like John Gotti really broke the whole sort of image rule of trying to stay quiet. But like, if you offended him or, you know, did something to, uh, I guess, injure him, you know, he, he wouldn't get, he wouldn't get irate or throw a fit or anything. You just, you just send up, you know, I don't know, in the East river or something. <laughs> it, it, it depended on, you know, on who would say what and who mm -hmm. Back to him, you know, Buffalino. Buffalino was treated, um, like I said earlier, uh, as he was, as one of the most powerful. The government identified him in the early 1960s. He was mm -hmm. identified him as one of the most powerful and violent members of organized crime in the country. Uh, but when you read this book, this is really more of a intimate look about two men. Uh, uh, Buffalino didn't have any children. So him and his wife basically adopted Bill, who had his own. He had, he had he, his father, but he had a terrible relationship with him. And really? Yeah, he had a really bad relationship, uh, which is, <laughs> which becomes known very early in the book. And so it's really, it's really a father and son story set set against this incredible 
uh, a story involving organized crime and all the different people that you meet along the way. Hi, folks. Here's Voss here with a little station break. Hope you're enjoying the show so far. We'll resume here in a second. Uh, I'd like to invite you to come to my coaching speaking and training courses website. You can also see our new podcast over there at chrisvossleadershipinstitute.com. Over there, you can find all the different stuff that we do for speaking engagements, if you'd like to hire me, uh, training courses that we offer, and coaching for leadership, management, entrepreneurism, uh, podcasting, corporate stuff. Uh, with over 35 years of experience in business and running companies as a CEO, and be sure to check out Chris Voss Leadership institute.com now back to the show that's an interesting setup setting because like when i when i heard francis Ford coppola really explain what the godfather was it really you know i mean it's a beautiful movie but when he explained the story is basically it's a king with three sons and when you look at it from that aspect it becomes much deeper and like you just said your book is about about you know this complicated relationship between a adopted son and a father um, it gives it more context, I think, in, in where you can understand what's really the dynamic going on. So would you call this a memoir of, of Billy's? No, no, not at all. This is a uh, me interviewing him for a very, very okay. long period of time and then writing his story. You know, we did our fact checking. We made our phone calls, you know, to um, kind of validate as much as we could. Uh, had I interviewed Bill for maybe, you know, a couple of weeks or so, Mm -hmm. I question a lot more that's in the book, but mm -hmm. I had so much time with him and we went digging into things that he told us and did our research that we feel comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but you're talking about a man that, you know, you just mentioned the Godfather. Uh, you know, there's, there's this scene in the book where Billy answers the phone and some guy says he's Marlon Brando calling for Russell Buffalino. And Billy says, there's a guy named Marlon Brando calling for you. And he thought it was a joke. And Russell says, give me that phone. And it was Marlon Brando. Holy crap. Because Russell had this outsized influence on the making of The Godfather. Oh, wow. Was before production had begun. Uh -huh. uh, and when they tried to stop the film. And then when he, Russell basically gave the okay and they started production in terms of who was actually in the, in the movie. Members of the Buffalino family, members of the Colombo family. So uh, Russell had great influence in the, in the making of that movie. Oh, wow. We had uh, uh, the author, uh, Mark Seal, who wrote uh, Leave the Gun, Take the Cannoli, the epic, sto epic story of the making of The Godfather. And I remember he talked about that where, you know, they weren't too happy to have this film made. <laughs> initially. No, not, not at all. No, they, and they, they caused a lot of problems for it. But when, yeah. the thing that was really good about Bill was that he was there. So this is mm -hmm. first-hand account. Sometimes... Actually, often you're getting third, fourth hand accounts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but these are, this is directly coming from him and his own experience and the stories that he shares. And, you know, he's never shared these before. There you go. So, uh, what do you think is going to maybe, uh, maybe some teasers that might surprise people or, or, uh, some different things that people might find in the book that will either shock them or make them go, holy crap, I didn't even know about that. Uh, I think just about all of the book is. <laughs> In terms of all the different people, I mean, if you think about it, uh, you know, we meet, you know, Johnny Unitas, the old football legend who meets with Russell Buffalino and with mm -hmm. Bill in the early 1970s. Of course, there's Jimmy Hoffa, uh, and Billy answers some of the questions as to what went on with the disappearance of Hoffa. And then there's Donald Trump and Michael Jackson, mm -hmm. which... You know, Billy did business with Trump on a number of occasions in the 80s and 90s, and Billy eventually became Michael Jackson's co-manager mm. uh, because of an effort by Trump to get Jackson to perform in Atlantic City. Billy interceded uh, to stop it, and but as a reward, he told Jackson's manager he was now his partner. Uh, oh, wow. So, you know, there's, just, there, there's a number. I mean, the book is just, um, it's really what it became, though it became more of a historical statement. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting, given so much that Billy had seen and had been a part of. Uh, mm -hmm. so for the first time, we're seeing a lot that went that went on during that period. And it, it, it's an interesting time period because, I mean, it, you know, it, it, it's the old mob before, uh, before uh, what's-his-face, um, you know, made it a show in the 90s. And, and John really, John Gotti, and really, you know, 
drew a lot of issues to himself and and it eventually you know the teflon eventually was was wiped off but it took the it took the it took the uh, justice department quite a long time to finally pin it to pin it to him but uh it, it, interesting story and why do you feel that as americans we're so we're so enamored by the mob and the mafia we love mob movies we love mob stories you know we love all this stuff why why is that such an important thing to us I think it's because we see a world that we're not part of. Uh, uh, I've often, as a journalist, seen the world as black and white with mm -hmm. a little bit of gray in between. Doing this book is a lot of gray. Mm -hmm. Billy, you know, it's populated uh, by people like Billy D'Elia who go in there. But it's not just organized crime either. You know, Billy gets called in. Billy became, Russell was known as the mob's negotiator. Mm -hmm. And when Russell went to prison in the late 70s and then through the 1980s, Billy took his place and he became the negotiator. You know, I just mentioned the story with Trump and Michael Jackson and the mob. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Billy got called in on a, on a number of things, but it wasn't just organized crime. It was entertainment issues. It was sports. It was politics. Uh, you know, when people, when they needed help and they had to go under the table, this is who they went to. And to me, that was pretty eye opening. Yeah. Did, does, uh, is he happy with the book, uh, Billy? Cause yeah, he's yeah, not. Yeah. He, he, I let him read it uh, before publication. He uh, had some concerns. He went to prison in 2008. He had been arrested in 2006 mm -hmm. on a drug money laundering charge and attempting to kill a witness. And that, that charge got dropped. And he ended up spending four years in prison. He got out in 2012. And he's, it was the first time he ever went to prison. Uh, and he doesn't want to go back. So... Uh, he had asked if he could read it and go through it, and I said sure. Uh, yeah. We didn't we didn't take anything out. Yeah, uh, it was really more about him. There's in some things it was just like semantics, like the, the scene in which Billy gets made is really unusual, and this happened in the early 1970s. And you know, Bill had concerns about admitting to the fact that he was a made member of a crime family and whether or not that put him in jeopardy. Um, you know, we explained to him that it wouldn't. I did, and his attorneys did. Um, so at the end of the day, you know, we, we left it in there. Um, so, but he was, yeah, he was fine with it. I think, uh, you know, we don't embellish anything and we don't, um, go light on anything. You know, it's the raw story and, uh, you know, and it's a pretty interesting life. The old original mob. Maybe the other thing we, the other, maybe the other reason we, um, find it intriguing is because of the secretiveness or what used to be the secretiveness of the mob, you know, the Cosa Nostra thing of ours where, where, you know, we don't talk about it, you know, and, uh, and I remember it being so secret. And then there's that famous Senate hearing, uh, I think with Bobby Kennedy in, in, uh, the sixties where the guy starts, you know, talking about La Cosa Nostra and exposing everything. And it, maybe it's because of the secretive nature of it. And, and the and maybe the fantasy that we have, you know, like we like Bond movies because you know we all like to be James Bond and be some secretive dude, and you know our lives mean something more than just I don't know going to McDonald's every day. Uh, and maybe that you know we also have a fantasy of power and and money and being in the mob and having you know some respect instead of I don't know the wife yelling at you every day. <laughs> <laughs> the mob, you know, the mob today it doesn't exist the way it did before, say, the mid-1980s, when the government really um, did a number on it uh, through its various prosecutions. But the mob had such a stranglehold on so many industries in this country. You know, yeah. Buffalo, for one, uh, was a power in the dress manufacturing, for instance. He had all these manufacturing firms in Pennsylvania, and he had contracts coming out of New York. So he, he basically controlled it. He also had a stranglehold over the Teamsters Union. He had mm -hmm been really good friends with Jimmy Hoffa in the 1940s. And he had actually, Russell placed his uh, cousin, William, there, who was an attorney with Hoffa. Mm -hmm. and William became the general counsel of the Teamsters. And, wow. that, and that gave, between that and between his friendship with uh, Jimmy Hoffa, that gave Buffalino incredible power. And the Teamsters ran the nation. I mean, a, a strike by the Teamsters cut everything down. Uh, so, you know, with that kind of power behind them, they could basically do uh, whatever they want. And we don't see that. We don't see that today. So it's a, it's a different world. Yeah. I think up until even the 90s, you couldn't pour a pound of cement in New York City without paying off someone in the mob. If I recall rightly, I don't know if that's 
officially true, uh, but they, they control they control the cement business in New York. I mean, they're still they're still involved in with different unions uh, mm-hmm. in New York, but not even close to what it used to be. Yeah, uh, prior to 1990, say um, the power has waned considerably. Any uh, chance? Uh, there's got to be a chance. That it's kind of a dumb question, but I'll I'll just I'll just shove put it up. Any any chances can turn into a movie like Goodfellas or Casino or you know stuff like yeah, that? Yeah, that's pretty much. I've done a couple of movies before. I just did uh-huh. last year on Netflix, and um, that's in the process. But it's all kind of turbulence out in California right now. With um, oh, that's right. Um, yeah. The writer strikes, the directors and whatnot, so and the actors, so. You know, it's going to have to get settled before anything moves forward. Uh, but, um, Martin you know, Scorsese, book, you should definitely option it. <laughs> <laughs> the book just came out a week ago, and it's just, you know, it's been, uh, the response has been overwhelming. And it's because of the, you know, basically because of the story. I think um, it's pretty emotional and intimate between Russell and Billy, you know, amidst all, the, all this craziness. And then plus, of course, you know, I touched on Hoffa before, you know, Billy explains what happened after he disappeared. Uh, mm-hmm. how we went to a meeting with Russell in, in New York and it was to keep Frank Sheeran um, from killing uh, two other men, Tony Provenzano and Anthony Salerno, who had actually ordered Hoffa's murder. And wow. So, uh, but I said to Bill during our interviews, you know, he's very, he was very close to Russell and always wanted to protect him. And I said to him, with Provenzano and Salerno have given that order without Russell's permission. And he thought about it. He said, no. So I said, so Russell had to have been involved. And he said, yeah. And it made sense because Russell had just been outed as being a member of these CIA mafia plots uh, mm-hmm. by Time Magazine. Uh, and this was at a time where there were these uh, church committee hearings going on in mm-hmm. Washington, which was focused on the CIA and its recruitment of the mob. And mm-hmm. so after that happened, a number of different people just started to disappear. Sam Giancana was murdered. Uh, Hoff had disappeared. And uh, another, Johnny Roselli, uh, was found murdered a year later. They were all members of these of these plots. So, uh, you know, Bill tells us who ordered uh, Hoffa's disappearance. I think the thing that still remains is who actually pulled the trigger. And where his remains ended up, I guess, huh? Bill says, in his words, he was cooked. So, so he was cremated then. Yeah, cremated. So within say ten minutes after the murder, which makes sense because yeah. you're not going to, you know, you've got this whole cottage industry of half of people for you know the past what almost fifty years, following it and talking about it, and you know he's buried under giant stadium, he's buried <laughs> in a garbage dump in New Jersey or whatever. It makes zero sense to kill the most well-known labor leader in the country and then transport his body multiple states just to dispose of it. That made zero sense. So I I would kind of believe what Bill has to say about that. Yeah. I think one of the movies or documentaries that was their surmise or something. I don't remember. Um, But, uh, you know, this is something that's intrigued us for, uh, I don't know, almost a hundred years. I think we've been enthralled by it. And and there's a romanticism to it that I think we have that's kind of interesting. I don't know why. Maybe it's power. Maybe it's respect. Maybe it's, you know, I had had issues with my dad and I thought that was complicated. But uh, Jesus, this takes it to a whole new level. (laughs) Yeah. You know, I'm not, I don't think, you know, it's not an excuse uh, for why Billy went with Russell. Mm. He had a terrible relationship with his own father. Mm. And like you said, it happens to a lot of people. And it's not a reason why someone might go do something they shouldn't be doing. Yeah. Plus, um, my dad, you know, wasn't, you know, all that powerful when I came. Right. But I mean, it had, you know, I mean, my father was a New York City police officer, right? Uh-huh. Um, so had I met someone like Russell Buffalino, the only thing I would be thinking of is, you know, my father in the back of my mind saying, just turn around and walk away. Yeah. Uh, you know, Bill did it. Billy liked Russell. Russell had a way about him. Russell took him in. Russell taught him. Russell trained him. He became, you know, he gave Billy an opening into a world that Bill, well, most people never would have. I mean, oh, yeah. there are scenes in the book where you're just meeting, you know, they met Frank Sinatra, for instance, um, in New York where Russell basically goes to a restaurant and a a bar that Sinatra frequented and sits at a table at Sinatra's table. And when he's told that Sinatra's coming that night, he says, well, you tell him this is my table. And if he wants, he could join me. And that's what, 
Sinatra shows up and he joins Russell and Billy was there. <laughs> so, I mean, these are the kinds of things that Bill, you know, it was a trade off, obviously, yeah. you know, but Bill, you know, to his credit, you know, I asked him this question multiple times and I said, do you have any regrets at all? And he said, no. And wow. therein lies the title of the book, the life we chose, you know, we chose it. It didn't end well for him as you read mm -hmm. in the book, um, but he doesn't have any regret regrets and he would, uh, he did the whole thing again. There you go. Well, I can't wait to see it in the movies. It's got to end up as a movie. This is one of those books that has to be a movie. Because um, we love these characters. We love the stories. We love and we love the romanticizing everything about it. I just watched The Godfather 50th Anniversary in theaters. And it's a remastered version. It was so beautiful to watch again. And uh, knowing some of the background stories, like from books like yours and uh, Mr. Seals, uh, you know, as, as, to, as to what how complicated these were if i recall rightly the story is uh what was it frank sinatra's story with uh was it benny youngman johnny fontaine. Yeah, yeah the johnny fontaine story of the of the uh band contract and i think it was wasn't benny youngman's band or whatever that that story came from with frank sinatra it's yeah. a true it's a true story he he'd signed him to a lifelong contract and he wouldn't let him out of it and, yeah there was two so actually you know two things russell Despite um, his outsized influence on The Godfather, he would never watch the movie. He refused to see it. Really? And even when the producer, Al Ruddy, offered him a private showing, Russell didn't want to watch it. And then I also asked Bill, I said, what was the most realistic mob movie that you ever saw? And he said, Goodfellas. Really? Wow. Yeah. He said, on, for the day-to-day -day on what these guys did and how they lived and whatnot, he said, uh, Goodfellas. Goodfellas was the most realistic, which was, which was also based on a very good book uh, by Nick Pelleggi. Um, so I found that interesting. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, that another great movie, Goodfellas. I mean, just just what a story, man. Um, so this is really interesting. Anything more you want to tease out or uh, pitch before we go? Uh, no, it's just you know I'm glad you had me on and talk to talk about this a bit. You know, it's uh, it turned into turned out to be. Uh, you know, from getting an email dropped on my lap to three years later, you know, being published a week ago and the book doing really well. You know, my understanding is we already went to a second printing after just three days. Holy crap. Nice. So it's been really well received. So I'm happy about that. So it's a very, very unique and interesting story. And I'm sure, you know, your viewers would find it uh, really compelling. Definitely, definitely. People love these stories and the romanticism behind them. So uh, pick it up wherever fine books are sold. Uh, and it's it's Delia, right? Delia. Billy Delia. Delia. I got to get that right. Uh, order up wherever fine books are sold. The Life We Choose, William Big Billy Delia. Deal? deal? I'm still Delia. There. Delia. Delia. There you go. The Life We Choose, William Big Billy Delia. 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 Why am I having such a hard time? And The Last Secrets of America's most powerful mafia family. Uh, Matt, thanks for coming on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And uh, uh, give us a .com as a shout out as we go out. Uh, MattBurkbeck.com is the website and Matt.Burkbeck.author is Instagram. There you go. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. Go to Goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss, YouTube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, LinkedIn.com, Fortress Chris Foss, all those places on the internet the Chris Foss show is. Thanks for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe. We'll see you guys next time. And that should have us out. <laughs>